So today we're going to be talking about prayer. And specifically, we are going to be looking at the prayer that Jesus taught us. Now, you might know that as the Lord's Prayer or the Our Father. But before we get into that and start breaking it down, I think we should talk about what prayer is in general. Prayer, really simply, is talking to God. Now, think about that for a minute. You, you can talk to God, the God, the one God, the one who made heaven and earth, the God who made everything out of nothing, the one perfect one. You can talk to that very same God. And he promises that he listens. That is what prayer is. So we get to the Lord's Prayer. And I've got like a question. Why is there this one prayer that Christians hold as so important? Well, when Jesus' disciples asked him, how should we pray? These are the words he taught. He said, this is how you should pray. And that right there is why most Christians have this prayer memorized and say it like at least every day. Now, a quick note. When I say the Lord's Prayer, I use some old school words like art and thy and thine. Now, if you find yourself reading the parts in the Bible where Jesus teaches this, you might see that that sounds a little different. They use, in most modern English Bibles, more up-to-date, day-to-day language. Now, it's not that one way or the other is right or wrong. I say art and die because, well, that's how I memorized it when I was younger, and that's how most people I know say the prayer. So it just kind of follows. But what's more important is that you learn what works best for you. Because this prayer speaks so much deeper than language. It goes right into our hearts. All right, so we start the prayer by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven. We're addressing who it is that we're talking to. God, our Father, our Dad. But not our Dad here on earth. No, our Dad up in heaven. You see, God is showing us that we can talk to him like we do a parent. He relates to us like a parent to a child not a master to a servant, and we can talk to him like that. We can talk to God like we do to our mom and dad. We can go before him confidently and ask him things like we would our parents. And we don't need to be afraid because God tells us that he's like our parents, and that means he loves us. And after that, we pray, hallowed be thy name. And this is a tough one because hallowed, is not a word we ever, ever say. So basically to hallow something is to make it holy or keep it holy, which helps us a lot because holy is another word that we use a whole lot, right? We pretty much only hear it in church and never use it outside of church. So a simple definition of holy would help, right? Holy means set apart or special. And God already is holy. God is holy in a way that nothing else ever is or ever will be. So when we pray this, we are asking for God's help to have him take his rightful place in our lives. We're asking for God to be holy in our lives. We're asking for help to treat him the way he deserves to be treated. Basically, we're asking for help to follow the first commandment. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, Jesus talked a lot about God's kingdom. If you want to know more about that, please read through Matthew and Luke. That's where we kind of get the most about God's kingdom. And what we're doing here is we're asking for things to start looking more and more like that. For things here on earth to start looking more and more like God's kingdom. We're asking for him to bring justice. We're asking for him to right wrongs. I mean, we all see things around us that are wrong. Things that aren't the way that they're supposed to be. We're asking for God to fix them, to make things the way that he always meant them to be. Give us this day our daily bread. Now, this is the line that kind of summarizes what I think most of our prayers tend to look like. God, I need something. Please give it to me. Now, at the time that Jesus lived, bread made up most, like a very, very large portion of what normal people would eat on any given day. And food is one of the few things that people actually need to stay alive. So we're asking God to take care of our needs. We're asking God to give us the things that we need. And it's all of our needs. 
physical, yes, like food, shelter, water, all that stuff, but also more. We're asking for our spiritual needs as well because Jesus is the bread of life. So we're asking for Jesus to give us himself, to give us that full and better life that he always intended us to have and forgive us our trespasses. We all mess up. We all choose to go our own way instead of God's way. We all do this. We all fall short. And so upon reflection, we realize we need forgiveness. And that's what we do right here. We ask God to forgive us for everything. And in the Bible, we are promised time and time again that he does just that. God forgives us. But there is another line that follows right on the heels of that one. After that, we say, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Now, that's pretty serious when we stop and think about it. We are asking God to forgive us the way that we forgive others. So what I think we really are praying for here is asking God for help to help us forgive other people the way that God forgives. And I think all of us could look a little bit more like Jesus. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now let's be really clear. God does not ever tempt us, but there are plenty of temptations around us. We are constantly bombarded with temptations to do what's wrong, to do things in the wrong way, tempted to care more about ourselves than others. I mean, the list could go on and on forever. There are all these temptations around us and it's difficult. And so we come before God and we pray, God, please lead us away from those temptations and please save us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. Now, this line's an interesting one, because depending on what Christian tradition that you're a part of, this line either flows right off of your tongue, or it confuses you every time you hear it because you didn't learn that this was part of the prayer. So, let's talk about it for a minute. Now, in most English Bibles, when you read Matthew chapter 6, the part where Jesus teaches us the Lord's Prayer, this line is not included. And that's because it looks like in the earliest copies of the book of Matthew, this line wasn't there. So what's going on here? Well, in Jesus's time, it was really common to end a prayer by praising God. You see it a lot in the Psalms. You see it at the end of almost every letter that's in the New Testament. Basically, it's a reminder of saying, God, you're awesome. Everything is yours. The glory, the honor, everything belongs to you. So, the other thing is, one of the earliest Christian writings outside of the Bible that we have found includes the Lord's Prayer in it, and it ends with this ending. So we can make a pretty educated assumption that Christians have been ending the Lord's Prayer this way since basically the beginning. Now, if you don't say that, it's okay. It's not wrong to include praise of God at the end of the prayer. But it's also not necessary because Jesus taught us the prayer and you can read it the way it is in the Bible. I 100% end the prayer every time by saying the honor, the power, the glory, kingdom, all of it is yours forever and ever. Amen. And it's a reminder. Like I said, this is the important part. It is a reminder that everything belongs to God. All praise, honor, glory, everything belongs to God and it should. God, you're awesome. Amen. So in a lot of ways, we covered just about everything we could ever pray for when we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. And that leads me to another thing. We can use this prayer as an outline to kind of guide our own prayers, guide the things that are going on in our own lives and give us the words to pray for it. So we can go line by line and expand on it. We can say, God, here are the things I need. Here are the ways that I'm being tempted. These are the wrongs that I see. Please write them and so on and so on. And when we use the Lord's Prayer as an outline, we may just find ourselves praying for things that we wouldn't have thought of otherwise. So some final thoughts on prayer. Prayer is talking to God and talking to God like a parent so we can tell him what's on our mind. Telling God what's on your mind, praying from your heart, that is a good thing. Sometimes we don't have the words to express our feelings and that's okay too. The Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit understands. And then there are times where you just don't have the words, period. 
And you can always come back to this prayer that Jesus taught us.